from the heart of Dubai, where tomorrow is being built today to the world. Welcome to the CTO Show with Mehmet. Here, we redefine technology and reimagine possibilities. With Mehmet, delve into the riveting realms of AI, cybersecurity, and digital technology. Experience the thrilling highs and lows of startups. Immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and witness the future of business innovation being written in real time. Now, without further ado, let's tune in and explore the future. Hello and welcome back to a new episode of the CTO Show with Mehmet. Today, I'm very pleased joining me, Nadra Abdelrez. Nadir, uh, really, you know, I'm appreciating the time. You are a busy CEO. Nadra is the CEO of uh, Money Hash. And I know how busy it can, but you took the time to be with me today. So thank you very much. You know, as usual, this is what I tell my guests, like, uh, I like them to tell us a little bit that about, you know, their background, their journey, and what uh, you are currently up to. So the floor is yours. Amazing. Amazing. No, thanks a lot to have me. It's uh, it's usually really, uh, really exciting to to take a break from work and kind of talk about it in the same time. So it's a semi-break, <laughs> I would say. Uh, no, but in general, I really appreciate uh, appreciate your work and excited to participate. Uh, I'm Nadir Abdelaziz. I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Money Hash. We're a payment orchestration operation infrastructure. And what that means is we help companies control their payment infrastructure so that it's programmably and intelligently uh, decide which transaction handled how with the consumer and uh, in the kitchen or in the back end of the business, how this works with the different payment providers or the different partners to post success rate, to uh, address fraud, to address loyalty. Uh, and multiple other things. We uh, it's a comprehensive operating system uh, for payment. Uh, prior to Money Hash, uh, my background is equally split between academia, where I spend most of my career um, doing some studies and research and teaching, uh, and this led me to switch to the business world. So I worked with a couple of startups uh, in the region and globally. Uh, before starting Money Hash with uh, was my dear friend Mustafa, who's uh, who's our CTO, and uh, we're currently a seed stage company. We we serve some of the large enterprises in in the region, fixing their payments and and helping them um, run a comprehensive payment strategy from a technical perspective. Um, and very excited to be uh, with you today. Thank you very much, Nader. I get excited myself every time I have a founder from uh, our region. Uh, I'm big believer in the you know talent. I'm big believer in the market. I'm you know so so this is why myself also I get excited when I have someone like yourself, Nader. Now usually maybe it's a traditional question, but I I like to ask this uh, every time to founders. You know everything comes from a pain point that clients you know live with it sometimes even they don't figure out that it's a pain until someone tells them hey there's a better way of doing that so i would love to hear from you nader you know the story of how you know you and mustafa your co-founder came up with the idea of of money hash so what were the challenges you you spotted uh, and you know you decide okay this is something we should be into to solve this problem no 100 percent. i think i think it's a mix between our excitement to solve this problem and our excitement to to build a company that solves the problem. So I think I can split why we started that into three, three main reasons. The first one is co-founder synergy. So me and Mustafa worked together in a payment company in Egypt called the XPay. And prior to starting Money Hash, uh, me and him were in between jobs. But really, our work together in XPay was extremely, extremely enjoyable from uh, from collaboration point of view and and our impact of working together and, and all of that. So there was a big incentive of us trying to figure out working together again, really. Uh, because after all, like in the startup journey, if you really like the people you're working with, you can go uh, long, way longer than others, right? Um, so that was a very important piece for us. Uh, and the second piece as well, we felt the region doesn't have enough uh, 
technically driven companies. Like there is a lot of companies that are doing really well from an operational perspective and has decent tech, but tech household software companies are not the very few companies um, that exist in the region and give uh, opportunity to talents like myself and others to to work on a quality piece of, of software. You know, like cars exist, but like there's someone somewhere is dreaming of building a better car uh, that's coming out of their own economy. Uh, so this is kind of was our dream. Can we build a software company, a high quality software, infrastructure software, complicated, exciting, solves the big problem from the region. These were two intangible incentives combined with the problem incentive, which is that we know COVID accelerated uh, the digital payment space almost at 100x speed. Um, that made the ecosystem overlook the significant problems in the payment ecosystem, which is it's highly fragmented. Uh, the technical of it is uh, immature, has a lot of refinement. The emerging market is going through um, very difficult catch up with alternative payment methods versus global cards versus local cards. What is the user preferences? What about my technical capacity? What about my product roadmap? It's a plumbing issue. And when you have a plumbing problem, you call a plumber. Uh, and we decided to be the best plumbers in, in payment in the region. Uh, and that was the problem we wanted to solve. We wanted to get companies, a reliable piece of tech that intelligently manage a very, very important piece of infra the infrastructure, which is the payments, receiving the money from the, their customers. Um, and that's what uh, we're working on. Amazing. You know, I, I love these stories and maybe not related to the, to the technology, but you mentioned something also people underestimate sometimes, which is, you know, the synergy with the co-founder or co-founders. This is very, very important. And the other thing is, uh, you know, the the passion to build a true software house. Now, I want to open a parenthesis and, you know, this is something all my guests, they know about me. Sometimes I come up with questions I didn't prepare, but this has attracted, um, you know, me in a deep way, I would say. Why do you think, Nadir, although we have a lot of startups, whether in fintech or other, you know, uh, B2B SaaS and even B2C space. So do you think like, the majority were trying just to take a proven business model, just like, you know, change it a little bit, localize it and push it so we don't care about, you know, the technicalities. Or is it, you know, because we know that there is talent uh, here in, in our region. What? Why do you think there is this lack in, in, in the ecosystem for true software house, to your point? I think it, it's a lot of uh, micro forces that get combined together. I don't think there is a major... Uh, a major uh, reason for it. I think definitely the region lagged a lot of uh, gross stage funding that can carry big technical companies through the, the hard times. And this will, will make a lot of companies kind of uh, not survive um, the tides of, of building the company. I think also, um, even when we have a lot of uh, talented tech in the region, the region doesn't have a lot of success cases on building software that either go internationally or uh, build the big market for it uh, in the region. This has started already with success cases like Uniphonic or success cases like Instabug um, that we have. We're building on top of, of these success cases of like household softwares that started to emerge from uh, the region or doing well or doing things at, at scale. Um, but the region doesn't have enough examples, uh, so things were a bit slow. I think things are now picking up uh, on that. I think also there's a lot of positive uh, factors coming into place, uh, like diaspora talent, for example. Uh, so diaspora talent in which like any, any very uh, talented people that left the region to work outside of the region for a while for big household names like Google, Amazon, or whatever, and after five, 10 years, they see an excitement to come back to the region while the region has a lot of injection of fund right now and contribute and, and become to lead their own startups or become uh, significant levers to existing startups. Uh, that also start, is, is creating a wave of, of new generation. So I would say money has just built on top of these early tries um, that while it looked like it's not successful, it was actually creating a fantastic fabric for us. 
uh, and we're now this generation of like just creating the new dent uh, of like, uh, is it now possible to get, to make it, to get larger on that instead of two, three household names, can we get 50, hundred if we can? Hopefully we will. Hopefully. So I like, you know, I'm very customer centric person. Like I work in tech, I, I work in consultancy. So for me, like the customer journey, neither when, when they, you know, decide to go with, with the money hash. So like how it goes. So today, from what I understood from you, and of course, like when I uh, checked the website, so today I've, maybe I'm a retailer, I might be an e-commerce owner, whatever. So I have like these different payment gateways and I have like, I have to accept MasterCard, Visa, Stripe payments, PayPal, and I have custom. So when I want to, and of course for each one, there's a separate API and so on. So now if I decide to choose uh, you know, your platform, Money Hash. What's my journey? Like, how this is will, wh- how I would, it would take me from, you know, where I am today to what you are promising. No, 100%, 100%. You know, the, the, the beauty of any operating system or any, uh, or any comprehensive infrastructure is it needs to take care of the customer across the entire journey. So we help our businesses from the, Whatever, where they are in the supply chain, of course, but let's assume they are going through all the problems. They are still choosing their payment partners. They are still building their integration. They are still having the checkout experience. They are still figuring out the programmability of the transactions. They are still figuring out the reporting and the refund. And our, uh, our software is built to handle all of this. So we have over 300 APIs pre-integrated that cover the entirety of Middle East and, and Africa. So we have uh, all the way from card integrations in, in Saudi and South Africa and Nigeria and Morocco to mobile money, to crypto, to uh, buy now, pay later integrations, all pre-integrated. On the one hand, you can um, sign up through us to these wonderful partners and then through a single API integration, you access all of these integrations and uh, as our team always call it, we turn it from an integration to a configuration. So it's no longer an integration problem. You just like configure another uh, another partner in your stack, but you do just a single integration on our side. So we help, we help the customer in the first journey, which is finding the partner, connecting with the partner, integrating with the partner, and building this first uh, API integration. But within this API integration, what people don't realize that the API integration itself has commitments in it on how the payment journey will look like for your user. Uh, so if you're using the right as a wrong API, the experience for the user will be, will be wrong. Um, and you, and you kind of like how to have, how to patch it. Think about it as like, a it's a water company. Uh, so this is the payment gateway. So if you're connecting with the water company directly and this connection is done wrong, you will not receive water correctly in your house. Right, so there should be a, a, a reliable pipe that creates this facilitation of uh, of value in, in that case. So our API embedded in it a lot of functionalities that help our customers build a decent payment experience, build a very very sophisticated payment experience, check out experience that um, customizes itself for based on customer segments, based on the markets, has a smart and dynamic way to show the brand and and, and to show the payment methods and interact these payment methods to uh, our payment orchestration engine, which is the engine that um, you program or set up ways to decide where the transaction will go, what happens, should I, should I do a fraud check, not fraud check, should I do CDS, should I skip CDS, should it be Stripe or Checkout or Adyen, and what happens when the payment fail, what happens when the payment succeeds. When a payment failed, is this payment is recoverable or it's recoverable what to do next and what the customer should see. We now empower the customer, the merchant that works with us to control every single small refinement from the journey of them building all the way towards the customer seeing and even the operations after that, like the refund and the reporting and, uh, and all of that. So it, it, is, it is quite comprehensive uh, from our point of view. Fantastic. And I also, because I, I'm a f- big fan of automation, so I've seen also you have put a lot of, uh, you know, automations, workflow optimization also for this journey, which is, you know, like, um, 
I talk a lot about, you know, how we can do this in shorter time, how we can do this in a more optimized way, like less friction. And I've seen like you've done fantastic job, uh, Nader, on this. Now, Appreciate one thing also I get to know about, like, which is, a, I think it's a great milestone, uh, with, which is the partnership with Visa, um, the, 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 car, the very famous uh, card uh, company. So what this milestone means to, to, to Money Hash and like how this will affect, you know, the way you do business. I think I think the milestone means to us and and to the ecosystem in general that the payment ecosystem is graduating. It's kind of like going from uh, the bachelor level to the master's level. And and what I mean by that is usually the merchant consumes their entire understanding of payment from their payment providers and from payment partners. And the schemes are kind of an ecosystem player in the back end, so Visa, Mastercard, and, and even the local schemes like Visa in Egypt or, or, or Madden in Saudi, they facilitate the playing between the issuer banks and the acquirer bank and the merchant and the customer and, and all of these different middle uh, middle players that add value in different uh, in different ways. So when we come to the market and we start adding another layer of value of consolidation and automation and, and intelligence. Um, we got to also gain the trust of the ecosystems that we can deliver to the deepest level of complication uh, of cases, especially when you deal with large enterprise. So by partnering with Visa and MasterCard, you now get an access to um, an open ecosystem of information, of capabilities that the merchants usually didn't know they exist or they know they exist through an abstraction layer, which is their, uh, the payment gateway or the payment service. And they now can pick and choose what they want to refine, what they want to do, and how they want to scale uh, to that level of granularity, uh, if, if that makes sense. Uh, and it's also a testament to the team because we are uh, one of the very first orchestrators, even globally, to partner uh, with, with the current scheme. So the, that's one of the things we're proud of, that like coming from our region and the emerging market, that we are not catching up with an industry we're actually in the uh, in the front of it is a good is a good thing to to uh, to be proud of of course like i think this is, should be everyone in the emerging markets should be proud of of such accomplishment and again congratulations nader on this sure. now sure. You, you, we we've been speaking about you know emerging market and fintech so how have you seen, you know, the, the fintech in general landscape in, in Africa and the Middle East, in MENA region, um, you know, have evolved in, in, in the past decade? Like you mentioned, like there's a break point, of course, which was the COVID. But, you know, how have you seen this evolution? And, you know, and this is a question that maybe I'm, I'm merging two questions together, but I think they are related. Some people, they say, you know, we have a surge in the fintech. Do we really need all these fintech, you know, startups? And it, it does really the emerging market need all these, you know, solutions, or do you see maybe in the future there will be some consolidation in that space? Uh, I would go hundred percent against uh, what's commonly being said in that file, and I will think we're even not one percent there. <laughs> uh, and there is way, way more fintechs that need to emerge than than that. Um, listen, the, the fintech infrastructure globally is, is really less than 1% built. It's really uh, not much is being built there. And so much uh, to, to build and so much to test and so much to experiment. And it can be presented to the consumer in so many flavors. And the venture game has a lot to do with building a competitive market and that through the competition and through the uh, the work between these different players with the different flavors, you get you get winners and losers and laggards and followers uh, like any other ecosystem. So do we need that many robo-advisory companies? Yes, we need as many robo-advisory, as many challenger banks, as many insure tech, as many uh, remittances, as many B2, peers to peer, as many B2B payments, as many uh, billing payments. Um, but as long as they all can figure out the differentiation and the approach to the market, uh, we got to embrace that some of them will fail for the good of the entire ecosystem from a success point of view. Uh, and to improve the quality of others, you got to build competitive space. 
Uh, and that's what we tell to our investors as well. Like we are, we are the first payment orchestrator in, in, in the region and, and one of the leading ones giving our integration network and our number of features we have and our hyper localization. But oh, competition is coming and there will be multiple orchestrators and multiple payment companies. And we got to be very excited about that because that will push us and make us better uh, and make us learn. And the customer will be winning in there. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, competition is always welcome to push, you know, for the way, for the benefits of the customer. So this is 100%. Now, shifting a little bit gears here, Nader, I got to talk about the, the investment. I, I prefer usually to keep it to the end. But, you know, for you, like on, on, on the personal journey, so you mentioned like you started in academia and then you work in consultancy. So this shift to the complete startup world, like, how much you know you know the background in economics your background also you know in engineering and how this all helped you to to shape you know the way to be a a founder for a company like now money hash is is taking you know more and more steps toward becoming a leader in the space that it's in and that to your point like probably others will follow but i mean this shift you know, because some some of the, of the people, they are comfortable in their comfort zone. You know, like they said, okay, I like to do this. So how was this transition for you, Nader? I mean, it was, it's a double-edged sword because uh, given that I did a lot of, in academia, I did a lot of shopping because I actually learned a lot of different fields, right? So I, I switched from the engineering to management and then from management to, to economics and, and critical science as well. And when you blend all of these together, it really lends itself well to, to strategy. So I, I work really well on my comfort zone is building strategy, building frameworks, building processes. And it's a double-edged sword because you have a kind of a, an ensemble of skills that I can use together to bring something different and sometimes take for granted and don't realize how this is powerful for, for myself and for the company. And sometimes it can also slow me down because I have too much in my head about everything or I can over process uh, a little bit. So you got to balance yourself. And this is even for all, for all founders. Hopefully they have, everyone do that. You got to balance yourself with the team that you have that they kind of balance you and then in the degree of processing, balance you in the, the speed and the execution, the background, so that you can, you can bring, bring a full picture uh, horizontally and vertically in terms of like topics in terms of uh, between strategy and implementation and, and what's in, in between. Uh, but I gotta say that uh, the startup ecosystem doesn't have enough uh, from the skill set of coming from like an economics or an engineering economics blend. So that's helpful in some way because we're working in the payment ecosystem and we're building a company that is very regional. So looking at the macro and being able to to move seamlessly between the macro and the micro is very uh, it's very key piece to how to we build the company uh, in the beginning. So we kind of embrace this as the DNA of the company that uh, our skill set is complicated and diverse. So we're gonna build a complicated and diverse product because we can uh, and we should. So that's uh, part of our uh, our mandate. To to your last point, Nader, because I think also you know there is a lot of talks. That happens mainly on LinkedIn. You know, there are some people uh, who are active thought leaders about the startup ecosystem in MENA. One time, you know, I am one of the big believers and I believe MENA region, all of the MENA region, I'm not saying only like UE or only Saudi or only one specific country. I say like uh, Cairo is a, can be a, a global hub. Dubai is a global hub can be, or it's, it is on the way of being a global hub. Every single capital in the whole emerging market. But, I did, you know, I was wondering, you know, because this is what you mentioned about the academia and, you know, how you took this. One of the things that I wanted to study, what made, for example, Silicon Valley the Silicon Valley? Of course, there are a lot of things. Capital was there, this and that. But it was, you know, the academia, which actually were behind, you know, all this. If we think about, you know, a company like Google, just to mention one. So, you know, Sergey and Larry, they were like, PhD students and they were working on their projects and of course Stanford you know from your experience do you think like the higher education is of course there are a lot of initiatives I don't want to you know underestimate but do you think you know 
you should we should do all more in this space you know what is missing uh, nader for us to really take this to really the next stage i think and and this is one of my incentives of of getting out of the higher education system which i really like i really enjoyed being in it so i love teaching i love research there was a reason why i got into academia in the first place but i think the the global world that is going through uh something called like a social acceleration in which like technology is moving much faster from a base perspective that everyone is behind academia is behind the economy is behind the politicians are behind right uh, if you're going to watch uh, the congress question a technical ceo in, uh, in in the us you will realize that there is like a big big gap between where, where is the politics and where is the economics and where is the old systems we build are and where is the technology and where is the, the economy is actually heading in, in, in that space. So I kind of believe that there's so many academic institutions that are, are far behind. Some of them has big brands and big names that they can uh, collaborate better with tech and engage better with tech. Uh, and the rest are, are all in, in the direction of like talent race and, and all of that. I'm really hoping to see more initiatives from uh, academia of starting building academia differently, like starting building different universities, starting building more entrepreneurial universities, more research-driven universities, more incubating, business incubating universities. And uh, some universities around the world call themselves that name, but eventually they still fall into the whole the structure of academia. Uh, and, and the all hierarchy of academia, which is in of itself is the ones that I think need to be challenged. Uh, but I can say the same exact things on politics and economics and how we treat the entire, uh, the entire thinking of, of the society when it comes to how we, we process tech, right? Like we're all like now about to be customers of AI, of AI or we are already customers of AI before, before even the societies discuss if they want to be customers of AI, right? This is the speed we're moving at, right? Like the speed in which the technology presents things and the entire society catch up on the conversation after adoption. That's the level of how late we, we are, right? Um, so there is, there is a degree of balance to figure out some pioneers here and there, but the majority is still, is still far behind, in my opinion. I, uh, hopefully things will change uh because to your point if we don't do something now i don't know when when we're gonna do it because things are moving very 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 fast and the gap yeah it's unfortunately good enough you know i'm i'm sometimes feel lucky at least here you know in in, in the gulf region and you know in the whole mina region there are these initiatives let's adopt the technology let everyone knows what we are doing so this is this is really really great now one other thing that always comes you know in the discussions about the startup ecosystem. And again, I have the debate with some of the thought leaders, like online and offline. You know, the impression is what we do as a startup founders and ecosystem, we are trying to take, you know, business models from successful companies in the US or in Europe. And we start these ideas here on the hope that we are being in the future acquired by a bigger player. Now, and we are blamed, and when I say we, I think sometimes we self-blame ourselves. You know what? I will never become a global company. I'm just going to, you know, grow the business. I'm covering, you know, I'm in my comfort zone again, covering MENA region, emerging market. Hopefully someone from the US, from Canada, from Europe will come and acquire me. And they are saying that we don't have enough uh, founders who are thinking on a global level to say, no, actually, I want to go out and push my product in the US, in Europe, in Asia, and maybe I'm going to start to do acquisitions in their local market. Why do you think this is not happening, Nadir? I, I'm a big believer that it will happen at some stage, not sure when, but what we need to do to reach that stage? I mean, first, there is a very important a piece to highlight which is like any any economy any ecosystem has stages of development and if this is the stage of development to are in that's fine like we should we should just embrace it and, and be be okay with it because it's one form of 
if it's one form of innovation, no judgment against it. Let's say it, it is dominant, but it's not uh, nothing against it in general. It's a good way to build, uh, if you're going to hyper localize a model that is global or hyper distribute it, so you, you're going to hyper localize the product or hyper distribute it or figure out something that is local, but it's still the same model or something, there is no judgment on that. It's in, in fact, it's a very hard task, extremely hard task to do that uh, in, in general. And to get acquired by an international company, I mean, even if that's what everyone is trying to do, I mean, it, it's not as successful. We don't have enough acquisition uh, in the region uh, in the region yet. Uh, can can a lot of companies can become global from the region? I think they can. Uh, are they not becoming that because lack of founders thinking that? No, I think I mean, most founders, if not all, hoping for that. Uh, and there is the bumps along the road, inner bumps and external bumps. Founders might not have the skill set to do it. Uh, their teams might not have the skill set to do it. They might not get the right support. Uh, so there is uh, a lot of barriers to break. And I think each company break, break some on behalf of the rest. Uh, in that case, uh, given that I'm Egyptian, we have a lot of... Uh, gross stage Egyptian companies that what they achieved in the last five years going through like multiple devaluations and political turbulence in the country for them to be in the level they are should be a case study globally for the level they achieved when we talk about companies like uh, Breadfast or Money Fellows or Maui or Maxent. Uh, in the middle of everything they have been through, extremely heavily operational company uh, coming from the Egyptian economy and be they are what they are. Uh, these are uh, fantastic level founders. Uh, and there is a lot of other founders that build the ecosystem for us, whether it's the founders of Rise Up or uh, the founders of Eventus or like uh, the founders of POS Rocket and Ordinary, and like in which, like the the ones that let, that help us see acquisitions, to help us see the ecosystem, or, or or all of that. So, is this changing? It is changing. Is the ecosystem thriving? It is, it is thriving. Um, but we still need as many acquisitions as possible in the region. We need small acquisitions, big acquisitions. We need uh, some uh, open failures. We don't have enough open failures, uh, in which people talk about like actually we screwed this up. This is not working. And we're going to share the story because um, we now have this like uh, um, collective toxicity that we can openly say this company failed and why it failed and how and, and what we're doing next and, and, and all of that. Uh, and it will be very, very, very exciting to see in the region at some point. Uh, and we need all of that, whether it's the acquisition piece or, or the rest. 100%. And again, like I'm not against like... <clears throat> a local company being acquired, but I would love to see the opposite happening. And yeah. to your point, you mentioned a couple of, you know, startup names. And personally, especially since last year, when I, you know, started to, you know, immerse myself more into the ecosystem, you know, the amount of talent, the amount of the, the thing that the people are building in the tough situations that you just mentioned, whether it's like economical situations, sometimes instabilities, and so on, or even, even you know, in the more like comfortable economies like in the UAE and Saudi and so on, you know, we have major talents and this talent should not go, you know, just like this to the sea, as we say in Arabic, you know, uh, you mentioned about the support. Like, is it, let's, let's, I like to talk it openly. Is it because we don't have enough investors in the region? Is it because the investors, they need just something that comes on the, you know, as we say, on a plate of uh, of gold to them, you know, and they just something cooked, hundred percent guaranteed, and then okay, we're gonna we're gonna invest. Is, is this what we are missing, Nader here? I think there is there isn't enough uh, gross stage funds in the region, and the early stage funds in the region are are quite aggressive in their expectation from early stage company. Uh, that's that's fact. There is like if you ask any other founder, I don't think they will see it any any differently. A uh, majority of them has to pitch traction that would be expected from a pre-series A company. Uh, and when they make it to the gross stage, they are picking from very few funds that has uh, the appetite and, and goes through a lot of diligence and, and things like that. 
Uh, will this change? I think so. I think the region is attracting more funds externally and, and more funds in the region are, are changing their DNA and, and getting more progressive about things and getting more founder friendly. That is exciting. But this is just like in its first 10% in, in, in full honesty. Yeah, we we still need a lot of time. Like, although, like, if maybe, you know, let me ask you, Nader, if I ask you about your, you know, in your domain, the market size, how much is it? Like, how big is the is the TAM, let's say? I mean, uh, you mean the TAM of my my own? Yeah, yeah. yeah so for yeah, you, yeah. Just, just as an example, because I'm going to ask another question. So, based yeah, on. Yeah, that. yeah. I, be I believe it's gigantic without saying an exact yeah i believe so it's, 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 in, bil it's yeah. in billions it's in billions it's in billion, right of course. Yeah, yeah 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 and you know like the the point i want to make matter is for example let's if we take fintech right and if we take only the emerging market which is mainly the middle east and africa right and and i didn't talk about latam i didn't talk about like some of the emerging markets in in, in asia it's a huge market so growth yes there is growth and you know what irritates me and you know i'm very transparent on this podcast like re despite like we have all these numbers you know the number one complaint from founders i spoke with recently is exactly what you mentioned so everyone now everyone knows that these guys are solving real problem everyone knows that these guys they have the talent everyone knows the market is big and is growing yet they are being unfortunately ask these questions which sometimes no sense so hopefully so hopefully this will change very soon uh, and i believe you know like if people who are missing these uh, opportunities they're gonna come back and say oh wow like we missed that opportunity because i believe you know we, we are on the verge of a big transformation when it comes to the startup ecosystem and you know for me i'm maybe doing a uh, you know, drop in in a ocean in kind of pushing people. So hopefully, uh, these things will change. Now, I want to come back to 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 something related to to you, Nader, which is, you know, starting a business and being in the startup is not something easy. And one of the things that a CEO need to do is to, of course, put the vision and you know build the culture and you know take care of the business. For you, like. What are, I would say, maybe the methodologies, maybe the, the tools that you have equipped yourself with so to make sure that, you know, all the tasks that a CEO have to do go smoothly, especially in a tough market like ours? Yeah, no, 100%, 100%. I think... I think all founders are different. You kind of have, you gotta double down on the things you're you're good at and and fill uh, fill the cracks on the things you're you're not good at. So I think like my own rubric wouldn't make sense for other rubrics, right? Uh, and there is some common wisdom that you take it, but you gotta kind of like synthesize it and reflect it on like. So if people are telling you like, oh, go go hire people yourself. Don't do like hiring campaigns. Well, if you're not good at hiring, then this is a bad advice, right? So like, see, that's a, a part in which like the common wisdom has to reflect on your, your own vulnerabilities and what's, what you, what you feel comfortable with and what you feel you still need to learn and what you feel you should delegate and stuff. In my case, personally, I, uh, I do believe, especially on, on trusting senior talent, I feel like that's a contract, a social contract. Uh, so I, I I really did my best on us not actually recruiting anyone in a critical position that I didn't reach out to them myself and to talk to them and get them on board without a recruiting campaign or anything like uh, so many of the positions you will see in the in the C level or managerial positions that we we went and hired them directly and, and found the talents we want ourselves without saying we're actually hiring and a reason for that is uh as i said it's a, it's we we take it quite religiously that this is a social contract these are other co-founders that will join there's a big journey daunting journey hard journey um so there is a marriage component to it that you gotta you gotta figure out so th this is one of the things that if you're a founder that is good in uh, communicating your vision to other talent and and reading other people and figuring out if they uh, if they are a fit to work with you and you can establish a decent social contract with them. 
uh, I would recommend for you to to headhunt and approach your critical uh, talent rather than waste your time on, on recruiting um, campaigns. So this is one of the things I, I set up from day one, and we we kind of doubled down a lot uh, a lot on it. Um, I think also one uh, very decent advice uh, that I received from some. So we we have a lot of uh, angel investors in our uh, cap table uh, that we we consider them really really helpful advisors and friends. Some of them are founders themselves. Um, so one advice I received was uh, to invest in middle management early because a lot of time you're being you're being pushed to think that all what you need is like junior mid level kind of talent to execute, but all the leadership level. Uh, is needed from you in the early stage, but in reality, you need to fill the cracks or your strategy weak weak spots and, and also build an infrastructure that will grow with you. Um, so this is one of the very critical pieces, like invest in middle management early, make sure you have leaders with you in the company to to balance you, to, to help you grow and to also scale the company uh, on your behalf, which is uh, fantastic. And then a third component that was really good for us is uh, to avoid nickel and diming as much as you can. Uh, so founders, especially in the region, uh, are uh, are really pushed to rethink every single penny. Right? Uh, this campaign will cost five hundred dollars versus one thousand dollars, so they can like spend a lot of time trying to optimize every single piece of cost. While what they don't understand, they are in a race and they got to only optimize the things that are critical, the things that are huge and try to not get into the nitty gritty details of everything and try to balance between uh, being wise and burning and, um, and their capacity as well. Uh, so they got to, they got to pay their talents well. They got to use, use tools early, even if it, it looks expensive. Um, it will pay off eventually. That's fantastic. And, uh, you know, great advice also as well, I would say, for fellow entrepreneurs, you know, who are thinking to go out and start building uh, in our region in the emerging market, uh, which is a market that I believe it has a lot of, uh, again, potential. I'm repeating this again and again. Nader, really, I enjoyed, you know, the conversation with you today. You know, if you want to say some final things and also where people can get in touch and know more about you and about money has no hundred percent listen i think uh and i'm hoping the audience while we're talking already opened money has with io and kind of check stuff if you need like giving the the technical crowd if anyone needs an input in payments even if if money hash is not the one to solve it for you we're just happy to be helped we're just happy to discuss whatever you need and, and, and figure out. So reach out, to, uh, reach out if you have any, any question about payments in general, even, uh, and if you are a founder in the early, in the early stages and the stages before me, um, uh, and, and would like to reach out for any input would love, would love to help you tell you how it went. Great. Thank you very much, Nader. As I said, I really appreciate busy time for a founder like yourself. Um, right. And especially, and again, congratulations on, on all the achievements that you have done so far. And I'm sure, you know, the future is bright for you and for the rest of the team at MoneyHash. For the audience, you know, you can find the link. It's moneyhash.io, but you will find it in the show notes. Or if you are watching this on YouTube, it's in the description. Um, and as I say at the end of each episode, this is for the audience. If you just discovered this podcast by luck, thank you for passing by. Please, if you like it, subscribe, share it with your friends and colleagues. I'm trying to do some impact here and I'm trying to share as much as possible founder stories, tech leader stories, and so on. And if you are one of the loyal followers, thank you very much for sending me your comments and sending your encouragements. I really appreciate that. Keep, come, keep them coming. And as I say, thank you very much for tuning in. We'll meet again very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hit that subscribe button, share the show with your tech-savvy friends and fellow entrepreneurs, and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Your support means the world to us.